Mark Gustafson and Guillermo del Toro. I sit very carefully. Two of our stars. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for sharing this film with us today. Um, Guillermo, let's start with you. Do you remember, whether it's a movie or it's a sequence, when you first fell in love with stop motion? Yeah, I think that everybody goes to the same point probably. It was uh, a mixture. I, I had seen stop motion with George Powell, uh, the puppetoons, and I had seen Gumby and Pokey, but fall in love, fall in love really hard. It was a Sunday with a bucket of fried chicken, <laughs> and I saw King Kong on TV. And it was just, I knew it was a little figure. I knew I was already a monster boy, you know? But I just couldn't believe the emotion uh, King Kong provoked and how uh, I, I felt for every beat on a movie that, that was so so uh, clearly to me that it was technically this and uh, that he was doing that, but I was completely enraptured, yeah. Uh, Mark, um, you worked with Bill, Will Vinton, the king of claymation, and uh, you've done stop motion for decades. How did you work your way into stop motion animation and was there a particular film that inspired you on this career path? Uh, for me, I mean, it was it's actually very similar to, to Guillermo. It, but for me, it was, uh, I think- A bucket and a half A bucket chicken. and a half of chicken, <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, it, was, uh, uh, it was Jason and the Argonauts. And, yes. Uh, the, I remember seeing that skeleton fight and just thinking, well, I was a kid. I had no idea. I was, it just, I was completely blown away. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't tell what I was looking at. I knew human hands had touched this stuff somehow. I guess, and uh, it only was years later I found out this guy named Ray Harryhausen had done it all himself, just one guy. And I thought, wow, that is amazing. Um, but then I forgot about it until years later. You know, I was in art school, and I I, uh, I wound up meeting Wilvin and 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 doing a little apprenticeship uh, with them. And then they just hired me out of school, and it was just so cool to go in there and see what they were doing. They had all these sets and puppets, and I thought, man, these people—they never had to grow up. You know, <laughs> they were literally they were playing with toys. And that's, I think, that that's what we yes. are really drawn to. It's yes. like this is like an incredibly expensive yes. set of toys, you know, that we get to just mess around with. And destroy. And destroy, <laughs> yes. yes. So how did the two of you meet, and how did the Project Pinocchio become the thing that we saw today? It was well, a dating app. Yes, it was a dating app. Uh, I, I, I put Tinder on my phone and then, no, no, you know, what happened is uh, I, I was already a fan of Mark. I had been doing uh, clay animation and stop motion since I was a kid. I had a company that did that and makeup effects for 10 years before doing Chronos and et cetera, et cetera. The people that worked in the film from Guadalajara that are in the credits are all people that came and I helped uh, aid in their experience and doing this and that. And I followed his career very closely. I, I noticed him on the Will Binton material. It was phenomenal, the leap it took with Mark. And uh, I, I'm a huge fan of Return to Us. I think it's a brilliant movie, and the animation sequences with the with the king and the stone moving around is so amazing, and then Mr. Fox and so forth, and <laughs> Mr. Resister, and all the shorts he he did, I followed, uh, so I I contacted him. We developed the project um, starting on the 2000, uh, and about nine nine or ten years in 
no, like seven years in, I called Mark and I asked if he would uh, like to take a look and maybe participate. And we we started from there. I mean, uh, as a fan and as somebody that respects uh, him, not only as an animator or somebody with experience in animation, but as a as a partner in directing. And um, so, Mark, what medium? are you using now? Is it claymation or is it a hybrid of different kind of media? Yeah, there's, there's no real clay involved other than sculpting the initial, um, you know, character designs and that yeah. sort of thing. I mean, these characters are, you know, they're, they're made of silicon and foam latex and printed. And, and printed. In the case of Pinocchio, we used the rabbit printing technology because it made sense because he's made of wood mm -hmm. a different material and we didn't really want his face to squash and stretch a lot we yeah. wanted something yeah. a little bit more graphic with him that was in keeping with you, what he was made of you don't want wood to look flexible and and we printed uh, we printed metal with pinocchio so you know there is I, they're very fragile they've been touring like a like motley crew frankly <laughs> They stay up late, they go places we don't know, they come back in the morning. <laughs> so I'm very, very fragile. But, uh, you know, this is a replacement, this is, uh, all the mechanisms are in there, you know? So he's completely mechanical. He has a little gear on the top to open the jaw. It's a beautiful, it, the inside looks like a clockwork machine. And they basically cost what a Lexus cost each of them. So we treat them carefully, but, uh, you know, we were in a dinner with critics in New York and uh, the, he came back really rattled. So finally I understand uh, when somebody says the actor was destroyed by the critics. <laughs> you know, finally I understand that phrase. So Guillermo, you've been making stop motion since uh, you started being a filmmaker. Yeah. Was it always a dream to actually do a feature? And what was it about this story that really compelled you to, to actually go through with it? Both things go back to infancy. It was. My second, uh, my second, uh, my first uh, film in Super 8 was with my Planet of the Apes figures. The second one was a serial killer potato that was, that out of hubris, destroyed, killed a whole family, and then uh, said, I'm going to conquer the world, step into the street, and was run over by a car. <laughs> a classic that was destroyed and chewed by the Super 8 projector. And, and then, you know, I, I always wanted, I was going to start, but the, the, we built all the figures, we built all the sets for a feature called Omnivore, and it was, my studio was burglarized. Uh, the first day of shoot, they destroyed everything. We have the photos that my partner, my, my girlfriend and my brother, we built everything. They destroyed it. They stomped on the puppets. They destroyed the sets and they proceeded to defecate on the floor, which uh, prepared me to work with the Weinsteins in 1997 <laughs> <laughs> on Mimic. <laughs> but then I said, okay, I'll do Kronos. Yeah. Basically, that was mimic, by the way. Just, <laughs> urination was included in that case. Mark, what's it like, uh, other than obviously fun, what's it like collaborating with Guillermo? I mean, what, what, how does the division of labor in terms of who's in charge of what and the kinds of things that you need to discuss together, how does that happen from a scene-to-scene -scene, uh, perspective as well as a, a larger uh, umbrella perspective? Well, I, I'm not even certain there was a division of labor, per se. I mean, we, we briefed the animators together for every single shot in the, in the whole film. So, uh, you know, I think the, the good news is, you know, when you, when you meet someone on one of these dating apps, you're never sure. <laughs> and then, but, Looking for Mr. Goodbar all right. over again, yes. But it, but it worked out. I mean, I think we, we, we got along really well and we had very similar sensibilities. And, and humor. And humor, <laughs> yes. And we trusted one another and, you know, I didn't take a dump in his <laughs> studio. No, no, so no. I, it was a, a, was already already up. a, a big improvement over my first uh, feature. <laughs> so, and you know, I mean, come on, it's, it's Guillermo del Toro. So <laughs> um, any chance to, you know, work with, uh, with someone with his filmography and uh, you, you just take it. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, unless we, you're 
pissing on everything. We, yeah, and, we, we, and, and the thing is, I really wanted to to uh, direct together, and uh, and 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 the melding, the mind melding, was beautiful, and uh, it was about uh, trusting. For me, I think that directors, as we age, we talk less and listen more. Uh, we watch, and it was so beautiful. I, I I I've been married twice, and I say more yes to Mark than either of my wives. You know. <laughs> Um, I have to be careful when I ask. <laughs> Guillermo, you're famous for having incredibly immaculate um, uh, sketchbooks mm -hmm. and drawings and character pieces. Um, and the thing about a stop motion is every single thing is crafted from yes. hand. I mean, yes. every single table, every single light yeah. fixture yeah. Uh, requires an enormous attention to detail. Mm -hmm. How much did you want to build specifically from your sketchbooks and how much did you have to delegate and farm that out to a lot of really, really amazing creatives? Uh, more and more I do it. I mean, uh, with The Hobbit, uh, it was I had such a liability and NDAs and all that stuff that I slowed down drawing in the notebooks. And now, and my partnership with Guy Davis is so intensely, uh, I mean, I can doodle and he understands what I mean, so I rely on Guy a lot more, a lot more, and which is not good for the notebooks, but great for everybody else, because they, they can work from a beautiful uh, drafting uh, of, of the idea, and we can lay out the, the visual language of the film really early, beautifully, uh, methodically, you know, I think it's better. I think you don't want to do everything, you want to do things with people that do it much better than you. That's, that's the goal. And inspire uh, everybody to do their best work. And that's really directing uh, is uh, investing yourself 100% and feel that is a portraiture, self-portraiture, and have everybody invest to the same degree. Uh, Mark, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, scale because um, there are dozens if not hundreds of different versions of every character based on how they're shot and what the landscape is around them. Uh, just to give a very ballpark estimate, how many different Pinocchios are there? And well, how big was the smallest one? How, how big was the biggest one? Especially in scenes with like Sebastian. Uh, yeah, I mean there were about 32 uh, Pinocchios. And you need to do that because you've got a whole lot of animators and you want the flexibility for all of them to be shooting at the same time. At one point, we were shooting on 60 units, more than 60 units. At a the thousand same days. time, yeah. a thousand day shoot. And, uh, and, and as it turns out, that's a lot. <laughs> Felt all right. And, and not enough in the end, too. No. But uh, yeah, so in terms of scale, yeah, we did a few. We did one Pinocchio, the, his upper torso and head, uh, very large. I mean, yeah. So that the cricket could crawl All, around six on feet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then you know a tiny, tiny Pinocchio. But the way we determine, the way we really determine size is you look at your hero character, which is obviously Pinocchio in this case, and you say, how small can we make him, and still have him be animatable. You know, and, and get all the mechanisms in there and, and really make him work. And so this was the optimal size for him. And you make them small because if you make them bigger, all the sets get bigger, and you run out of space. And if you're yeah. if you have sixty units uh, and going, the props and props, everything gets mm -hmm. bigger. Yeah. And uh, Geppetto would get bigger. So uh, he really dictated the the scale of our whole world in the end. Yeah. And the, and the bigger the puppet, the heavier the puppet, and uh, the harder you're going to go with the armatures. And you know most animators like their armatures tight and ready. And, uh, you know, I think that you telescope in and out to sets and, and props. The church is one of the largest sets. And it's, it was pretty goddamn big. And the training camp is basically, uh, you know, a small room. Yeah. And we had to build two of those churches. Yes. Yeah. And repeat one everything. One for pre in Presbyterians it. and one for Catholics. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we also had to build four Geppetto workshops. Yeah. Uh, for no re particular religious reasons. No. But we just needed them. 
But, but, but that includes hundreds of props in the Gebetto oh, workshop. Oh, hundreds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Guillermo, did you have a particular scene that you had in mind that uh, no matter how much you were collaborating and, and discussing, um, that it ended up coming out so much different, but in some ways maybe a lot better than you expected it to be because of all the other artists working with you? Absolutely everything, because the, what, what, we, what we both were in awe is the fact that, look, we created an environment that is very, very rare. Number one, the style of acting is not pantomime. The style of acting was completely realistic. Puppets listening with uh, minimal gestures, quiet scenes. Uh, we uh, did uh, failed acts on the puppets, m mistakes, so to speak, improvs, and all the animators uh, were guaranteed on the first day of production, vehemently and publicly, we said, nobody will fuck with us. No notes from the studio, zero notes from the studio, and we will never preview this movie to find out what a family of soccer moms and pops thinks about it in Tarzana. <laughs> Screw that. And, and they, and they, and they, they got very inspired. Yeah, although we did do one focus group and we found that <laughs> if you open a film with an old man weeping on a child's grave, yes. it's like, go for now, it. That, but it, I think that we made the movie in this budget, which is at roughly less than half of what the normal stop motion big picture costs to have that freedom. And that, that rippled or dominoed all the way, but to not have to listen to anyone except the artists is incredibly compelling, you know, and, and, and it guarantees that safety. And when the reason it took 15 years to get this movie here, 15 years, half of my career I spent peddling this movie to everybody that said no. And it's because the first thing they would say, is it for kids? And I said, no, but kids can watch it if their parents talk to them, you know, because what most of the industry in animation uh, thinks that they need to create nanny movies or babysitter movies where they plunk the goddamn kid, turn on the TV, and they don't have to talk to them for two hours. And we were, we were doing a movie that needed to stand with Pan's Labyrinth and Devil's Bag one, side to side. Similarly, Mark, was there a sequence uh, or a couple of sequences that were so incredibly complex and so beyond what you were expecting to do and were incredibly <laughs> ambitious that you had flop swepts about actually getting it done? And when you, when you did, you had almost like a cast party just because you were able to achieve it. Were, were there any that in particular that stood out for you? Yeah, there was one that um, it's not even, when you look at it, you're like, oh, it, it just goes by. You know, it's not particularly spectacular, uh, but it wound up taking us, uh, uh, from the time we got the first shot to the last was probably six months, weirdly, and it was just that shot where Cricket is under the, he gets put under the glass and a hammer gets put on it, and, and he, he draws, you know, the, Looks Pinocchio, at the drawing, yeah. Yeah, looks at the drawing. Pinocchio draws the thing, and boom. It doesn't look like much, but boy, was it a pain in the ass. <laughs> I mean, it was it was really hard to figure out how to do that shot. Um, and uh, oddly enough, some of the bigger, sort of more spectacular shots, you know, weren't that difficult because we knew we knew how to do them. They may have taken a lot of time and effort by um, you know everybody, but uh, yeah. that one in particular was yeah. really difficult. Yeah, because we were, I mean, we had our animation supervisor, Brian, uh, was is very, very much uh, uh, a zealot. Danish. And a Danish zealot <laughs> that, that is, is, is the Taliban of animation. And, and, and basically, the easiest thing would have been, well, we do the glass digitally, and we did it all real. So the, the puppet is animated, and the glass is real, and it just makes things, but it makes things more beautiful. Yeah. 
And I think, I think that in pursuit of, one thing I used to say is we're only as good as our worst shot. Which That's I it. did. Yes. No. No, he did, he did the last shot of the film. He did the last shot of the film because one thing I did, I was the, the unrealistic and transigent guy. And I said, we got to repeat the last shot of the production. I said, we got to repeat it. And Mark said, there's no more animators. I said, there's you. <laughs> <laughs> and he hadn't animated like an how long? Uh, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he repeated the last shot of the production. Yeah, I went into the studio and I kind of stripped yeah, my jacket yes. off. And I walked. <laughs> yeah. Thir we repeated approximately 30 because uh, stop motion is more like live action in the sense that the puppet for real uh, transverses a space in time and space from here to here is shot in order. You cannot take out six frames and make them better. No, it's happening. And uh, if you repeat it, we repeated about 30, 35 shots in this film because we saw the puppets moving, but not alive. And anybody can move the puppet, but we said no motion, emotion. You know, and I don't know why it's moving there. So I got to know, there has to be thinking. We got to know what the puppet is thinking or feeling and why it's moving there, blah, blah, blah. And I really think that uh, when you when you do that, uh, and they know that they have the room to fail, the, and the animators say we they can try things. We said between action and cut, we gave them every gesture what we wanted, and I said, but if you find anything in the middle, try it. If the puppet wants something, do it. Yeah. Um, Guillermo. Uh, fairy tales usually start with some kind of indeterminate once upon a time. Mm -hmm. um, but like, uh, like Devil's Backbone, Backbone or uh, Pan's Labyrinth, um, there's a very specific time and place about uh, fascism in the 20th century yeah. that's part of Pinocchio. What was important to you about using that theme and that motif, especially about their cruelty and their evil, um, as part of your Pinocchio story? Well, I, I knew it was going to be a father and son story that was going to be told through different fathers and sons. And ultimately was about, it, uh, was about echoing those figures, including Jesus and his father. His father was pretty unreasonable. You know, <laughs> yes, you know guess what you're doing on Saturday, son? I don't know, dad. It's my 33rd birthday. What do you think? You know, and, and, I, and, and that also includes sort of the worst form of corrosive paternalism, which is the strongman figure in, in fascism. Ultimately, fascism is a fictional father that attracts all, a lot of stray souls to it. And, I, and we knew that the, the core differences on this Pinocchio was disobedience being a virtue and not needing to change to be loved. Because fuck that. I think that if, if somebody, somebody doesn't love you the way you are, run the other, in the other direction, no matter what they say. And, and as part of that, the understanding that it was not about Pinocchio learning to be a real boy, which is, I'm sorry, bullshit, is about Geppetto learning to be a real father, which is real, is a real need. So all of that, uh, fascism, uh, that is one of the five strands. The other ones are life and death, how brief uh, life is, how death is more maternal and loving than life. Uh, which is a little irresponsible, and frankly, uh, and uh, and if we what, that that was a delicate thing. In order to keep those five strands alive, fascism could not be on screen blatantly, but permeate all the interactions. It changes the town. It makes the priest and the and the uh, podesta more important. Who was. Uh, just a guy that made horseshoes and uh, like Mussolini's father, you know, that, uh, and, and, and changes all those dynamics. But ultimately, like Devil's Back, one, one of the things I wanted, let's keep it on the periphery. You know, we couldn't show war, for example. So Pleasure Island become a re-education camp where they play with the guns and the grenades and everything is fun until he puts the gun on the table. You know, and then you can test disobedience. Disobedience needed to be tested and tried with the uh, sort of pageantry of show business. 
and fascism, for real, for something heavy. So instead of making them donkeys, they give them gas masks. And instead of that being the harrowing thing is shoot your friend, which makes it very real. All of a sudden, it's not a game. So all those, to grab those elements and balance them on a screenplay and keep those five strands alive is a real uh, balancing act. And it took many, many years. Yeah, so that was, thank you. I'm by, <laughs> and if I may add, <laughs> and and I sort of hinted at this, or actually you said it, but this really is kind of Geppetto's story. Yeah, I mean he's the like Pinocchio comes into the world, you know, naked and unfinished, and that's kind of the way he stays for the whole story, and it's just everybody who he encounters who who changes, including uh, including Geppetto, mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, that really is very different from the uh, original Collodi story. Yeah, because uh, Collodi is, is at the foundation of a republic, and he needed something different. What, what we thought, we wanted to make a movie about now, and there's nothing more urgent than disobedience right now. That is the most urgent thing you need. And, and this little guy changes everyone, makes, makes uh, uh, Spazzatura, Revel against uh, Can Volpe makes uh, Candlewick finally be able to tell his father what he feels and thinks. Makes uh, uh, Geppetto go from a curmudgeon that likes perfection and ide idealizes the gone kid to a guy that embraces imperfection and accepts death. That's the most important part of the journey. Geppetto cannot accept death and prays for a miracle, gets one, and doesn't recognize him. And then at the end, he is at peace with death, which is, by the way, the same goddamn ending than Kronos. <laughs> exactly, the, rejecting immortality and dying in bed with, uh, with the granddaughter in there and grandson. So I've been repeating myself for 30 goddamn years. <laughs> um, Mark, uh, one thing I've always loved about um, stop motion is the 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 expression of emotion is so uh, incredibly detailed. The, the landscape of the face with the enormous textures in emotion. Um, talk a little, a little about, about how each character was treated among the team. Were people dedicated specifically to a single character or a single type of modality when it came to expressiveness? So that way there was a consistency across the board when it came to having that character be authentic? Well, the animators were obviously immensely important to us because they are our actors. And so much so that they're credited before the actual actors in the film. And that was important to us because they brought those performances. To they're those not puppets. technicians. No, they're not. They're artists. And we did, you know, when you shoot something for a thousand days, you really start to know your animators and you understand, well, this person is really good at Geppetto and really good at emotional scenes with Geppetto. And this person is really good at action or action with Pinocchio. And so we did very much try and cast the animators onto certain uh, of the characters and certain sequences. We, we also tried to give them whole sequences as much as possible. Which There's is a, not, not usual. No, no, and it, it doesn't, it's not the most efficient way to schedule a film like this, but we felt like it was important that they own these things. Like there's a, the scene in the bedroom where uh, Geppetto is putting Carlo to bed and then later putting Pinocchio to bed. That one bedroom, one animator, Tucker, spent two years in that bedroom doing those shots. But the advantage of that is he really knew those puppets. He, they were his puppets. Those were his scenes. He knew he was going to own it in the end. He was going to be able to sit down in a room full of people like this and look up there and go, I did that. And, you know, I remember when I was an amateur, there was that satisfaction of realizing that you had done that because there's, there's an incredibly intimate relationship between a puppet and an animator. It's like no other... You don't find it almost anywhere else in animation because it's just a camera, there's curtains, there's an animator, 
and they perform. It's like live. It's it's like a live performance, mm-hmm. and and they are responsible for that. So they, they and they, oh, we had fantastic animators. Yeah, it's it's so much close to live action, which is one of the. Uh, and you're shooting them on a real set with real cinematography, real props. Uh, real acting linearly is it, it, so close in so many ways that I think of Ginger Rogers uh, and Fred Astaire. Stop motion is to live action what Ginger was to Fred, which is she did the same steps but backwards in high heels. You know, and, and I think the beautiful, if you can imagine, each animator yields between one and three seconds a week after working. It's like milking a mummified cow. You work all day and one drop comes out. And, 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 and the, the beauty of this is they have to sustain that passion uh, with puppets that are really, really complex and temperamental for years, years in a row. And 45% of our animators were women, which is not, this is, this, Mark, Mark was very pointed about this. He, he said, this is a boys club, let's break it, you know? And, uh, and, um, there is a whole uh, group of uh, animators that we founded, designed, and helped them build a new workshop in Guadalajara, Mexico, and they got to animate. The cricket dancing is animated in Mexico. The, the sequence with the, with the rabbits, because we, in, 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 a, in stop motion, how do you do representation? Pretty hard, but well, we got the cast from Mexico to animate the, the black rabbits, Pinocchio, uh, the cricket, and now that changes everything in my country and in my hometown. Changes it forever. Guillermo, um, this is a musical. Uh, and you co-wrote most of the songs. Um, so, <laughs> Well, uh, let's, let's... Uh, allow me to disabuse that notion. <laughs> Uh, we started, we were gonna, we talked to Nick Cave and with Beck, and they, I was super impressed when Nick Cave walked in. I was like, oh my God, that's a rock star. And we found out one thing, it's really hard to schedule meetings with Nick Cave and Beck. And, and I said to Alexander, you know who's really available? Me. And, and I said, why don't we try one song? And he said, well, okay, and I tried the lullaby, my son wrote it really fast, and I thought I was Paul McCartney, and this blessed, you were so talented, and I accept compliments very freely. And he said, you should write everything. I go, of course I should, why not? And uh, I came with a, with a package of lyrics, and very soon Alexander said, you shouldn't write everything. You know, you, you should, we we'll get a real lyricist, but we broke the back of the songs. We, we came up with, like, uh, what do you call it? Call it, everything is new to me. The key phrases, you know, we were kings once, can we be kings twice? So those, that's, that's really, my collaboration was sort of breaking a few of the uh, phrases and the, the meaning of the song and all that. And then Alexander and Katz, well, except for the that, and I think the ones that are uh, Chao Papa and uh, my son were, a little more intense, but it is them. And Patrick McHale, who wrote largely the, the rabbit song. And it was, uh, and Patrick, I believe, was the one who came up with the notion of, like, okay, we're going to have some songs in the first half of this film, but as soon as fascism starts coming in, it's just going to be hymns and marches for the most part. From the period, yeah. Yeah, and we... You know, it's everybody stops singing. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and and it's sort of a musical, but you know, we there's a moment. Um, I'm sure you remember where uh, Pinocchio has just come to life, and he sings his song, and then Gepetto throws him in the closet and leaves, and then uh, Pinocchio comes out and he wants to follow him to church, and Cricket's no, you can't do that, and then he's about to launch into his the, song. The show stop. The show the stopper. stopper, and he's he's ready to go, and then Pinocchio just crushes him and interrupts. And and I think what that did for us was it's it sort of subverted the audience's impression. It's like it's, oh, this is going to be a music. Oh, this is going to be a musical. He's going to sing, yeah. and we're like, nope. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was important because we we were thinking the audience is going to be groaning. Quite literally, oh my God, is this going to be a musical? There's already the first one, which is amazing. 
every song in the Disney is a classic, and and we said let's destroy the cricket, <laughs> and that which which comes from Collodi's book, by the way. Collodi crushes the cricket over and over and over again. Yeah. And we wanted you to know that the cricket wasn't going to be dispensing wisdom all through the movie. No, so it's, no. it just wasn't going to. Neither the cricket nor Geppetto are particularly smart. You know, there's a great moment in the church when Geppetto says, he says, why do they, uh, Pinocchio says, why do they love him and not me? And Geppetto says, well, uh, people uh, are afraid of what's different. And, uh, and, uh, are you ready for school? <laughs> He's incapable of giving real guidance. And same with the cricket, you know, you will do our best and that's the best anyone can do. It's like a Chinese cookie. Yeah. Um. Mark, uh, stop motion is about as old a practical effect in cinema as exists. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, uh, I think it's very easy for a lot of people now to be dismissive of anything they see is just, oh, well, it's just digital. It's all yeah. digital now. Um, talk about how you integrated digital tools into a process and a technique that is fundamentally analog at its center. Well, our first rule was, if we can do it in front of the camera, we're gonna do it in front of the camera. And we did achieve the vast majority of this film in front of the camera. But, you know, there's there are some things that digital tools are just better at. And we would be wasting our time trying to do all the rain, uh, or smoke, or fire, and, but even in those cases, what we did was, like us use fire as an example, we said, what, what does fire look like in our world? And if we were going to actually animate it ourselves practically, what would, how would we do it? And we did it. We did tests of fire that we did on stages. And, and then, one of the shots is our and fire. One of them, they actually the let, we left it in the yeah. film. And, but then we gave that to you know, the digital artist mm -hmm. and said, this is what fire looks like. And because there's so much of it, because Guillermo likes explosions. And, you know, and rain. And rain. <laughs> you know, we didn't have to. And we snow. Could, <laughs> Are you done? No, no I like no, it. Okay. <laughs> Um, now I've lost my train of thought. I don't know where you were going. Right. But uh, we, uh, so, <laughs> yeah, we, we could not, we didn't have to focus on those things which were very labor intensive because the things that were important to us were the performances in those scenes like in the church mm -hmm. between Geppetto and Pinocchio. That's really hard to do, you know, to get it right because quiet. if it, quiet. Uh, because, uh, and if it doesn't feel right, you, if it feels false, you're going to recognize it immediately. It had to feel true. And so that's where we wanted to put our effort. Uh, but, you know, having said that, there's all this technology that, of course, we're going to take advantage of it wherever it makes sense. And even stop motion itself, you know, the, the yeah. technology of, uh, you know, of printing and the, the mechanics within the face, that's all advanced to the point where, you know, this is a great puppet to animate. The animators just loved it, both of them actually. But Geppetto, you can get a lot out of him. Yeah. And without, and if you're not printing him, if the animator has control, they can really get in there and do minute uh, variations. And they feel like, oh, it's their performance as opposed to a prepackaged set of faces that mm -hmm. are printed and they're just popping them on. But you can get, for example, one of the advantages is you can erase cranes that are holding the puppets. You don't have to do tie downs for everything. If you, if, if the, the death puppet, which is incredibly heavy, or there's a great scene where Geppetto improvs a little fight with a balloon, and the balloon and Geppetto are held by cranes, and you can erase them. Those are great advantages. But uh, even so, for example, in, in the water, when the camera breaks the water line and then goes under, Frank Passingham, our cinematographer, had to have the puppets lit by the sun and in the imaginary line, light them for dry for wet. So change of light, change of light. So the camera looks like it's going in and out of the atmosphere. And those are difficult things to plan, beautiful, but they are done on camera. He also, Frank, also did some really beautiful things with moving light where yeah. uh, in on some of our landscapes uh, he he 
put up these these gobos and and control them, you know, with a computer. So they were moving. So that the effect is, it looks it looks like clouds are moving, and it's got like yeah. barely barely visible. It's the sort of thing that you don't even notice, but but a set, you know, something we've built that's inside of a building, all of a sudden. It has a life, yeah, and you just feel it, and it feels alive. It feels yeah. real. And the animators, if the rain was hitting a, a model, we animated the the dots, the little rains, the drops, and and to give an example, so people don't think, oh, and then computer. When Gebetto dismounts from the table with a, a package of popcorn, every single kernel had a wire, and every single kernel was animated. So. Most of the things we did beyond the measure of prudence. Yeah. <laughs> um, Gamer, let's talk about casting uh, a little. A lot of really famous people, especially Ron Perlman, who you've worked with regularly. Um, well, that's but, like that's like alimony. <laughs> I gotta do it. I gotta do it. But it's a, it's it's a, it's a wonder it's a it's a wonderful cast. But the fact that you had to animate so much of what they were talking about. So long ago, when did you actually do the recording of oh, most of them? Years before. I mean, you got to break down the the you know the exposure sheet, the consonants, the vowels, the sing. You have to have all that way before you have it. But uh, but with the cast, uh, you have separate sessions. For example, <laughs> Cable and Chad. The last set of sessions uh, were done in London, and she, she was, was the monkey. She was the monkey's pazzatura, <laughs> Kate Blanchett, and Kate was doing the monkey. And then we would leave, and she would uh, you would see Todd Field come in, and they would record Tar. So she was going from pazzatura the monkey to Tar in the same session in London. That's how long it took. That's how long it takes. And some other actors, like Gregory Mann, who plays Pinocchio, who's a godsend because he's so real and so pure. At the end, he was like, he was talking like uh, Barry White. Was like, <laughs> so we had to find a sound like who was improbably named Alfie, uh, Alfie Tempest. Tempest. <laughs> yes, which is like a superhero name. Uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, uh, but you do it many, many sessions, but you start really early. Ewan McGregor, who does a brilliant job at the cricket, he really... He got the cricket only really fully on the first session, and that first session went as follows. He was coming in from crossing uh, the continent on a motorcycle, and his first stop arriving to Los Angeles was that recording session, and he didn't know he was recording. He thought he was just meeting us to discuss the project, and we pushed him in the booth and recorded most of the dialogue for the film, and he never really completely got the cricket again. Um, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. One final question for huh? each of you. Um, whether it's something that you We can learned... still screw it up. <laughs> Don't clap. So whether it's something that you learned that you definitely want to do again or something you learned that you never want to deal with again, what did each of you learn? And you may have learned many things, but can each of you itemize one thing that you learned from making Pinocchio that will influence your future as an artist? Uh, I think what I learned is, and I knew this, but this just reinforced it, is that animation isn't just for kids. You know, that it is an art form. And I'm really excited to, to see other storytellers uh, get their hands on this stuff and and see what they can do with it. Yes. Yeah. I think that uh, if we had to do it all over again, we would do it exactly the way we did it. And I think it's, it's because uh, it is in 30 years of career, the purest, the most intensive, exciting, and beautiful, uh, endeavor I've ever had. We had, a f you know how people say a family and most of the time it's a man's own family. You really want to get the hell out of there. You know, I think that in this, in, in, and there is a saying that I love, with, which is in every project there is somebody that is the asshole and when you cannot think of whom, it's you. <laughs> and, 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 I, and, I, and I think what we found is animators, no, not you. You're nice, yeah, you're super nice. Uh, 
animators, they didn't want to leave. We had animators that uh, said goodbye four times. We had uh, the most beautiful uh, chances of animators that were junior animators coming up and being heads of, of animation. We had one animator that had been really, really mistreated in a production just very recently, and we were able to make that animator it's like healed. a rescue dog. Yeah, it was really. like, no, it was, it, was, it was really healing. And you saw them heal through the sequence with the puppets. So it was everything you can imagine going right went right. And everything that went wrong didn't matter. So that I want to do again, over and over again. Yeah. Mark and Guillermo. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for being so generous in your thoughts. Thank and you. uh, good luck with the film. You promised us food Thank you. and drinks. <laughs> That's right. Are they and, there? Oh, and now go home and, <laughs> and run it over and over again on Netflix. On Netflix. No, Please. Number one in the world. Number so one. So let's keep it that way. <laughs> Thank you. Sort of came across it in yeah, about two, 